so much to do, there's so much going on um, with us, with all the groups, with everything, that what I think I'm doing is going to randomly rattle through a whole bunch of stuff, um, which is kind of about how we move specifically, how we move forward from here and in different states. It's always good to think in terms of everything you have to do. It's one of the key things that um, I can argue in town halls like this all over Scotland is it's not about one thing. This is about getting away from one thing politics. Westminster's one thing, we bash the asylum seekers, then we can leave everything else alone, and if we cut benefits, we can leave it. It's not one thing. And so we have to work at lots and lots of different levels. And I just want to say that um, there's not a shred of me that's any less committed to independence than was before. But then again, during the independence campaign, I always said it's independence for something. And I was talking at a public meeting like this in our Miners' Welfare Pen Cook a couple of weeks ago. We were having lots of good theoretical discussion about what next, how we change, how we go forward. And a guy stood up and says, I'm a pensioner. I'm, I've been on disability. They've taken it off me. I'm cold and I'm hungry. And I've been considering suicide. What do I do? And that clarifies your mind. You know, it is everything that we do now. And, um, you know, those of us who are yes are largely the people who are most strongly committed to social change in Scotland. So I will be weaving together all the different strands of things that I think that we can be doing, that Commonweal is doing, and that others are doing. So, for anyone who hasn't heard the basic structure of how I think we get out by 2020, um, let me give this a suggestion. So, first of all, I think everybody's now got to the point where we realise that our collectivity is our strength. Um, that this, this movement, the Yes movement, was strong because we were diverse and thoughtful. It's why the mainstream media were so desperate not to report us properly, because we are what you know, the public said they want. Political movements which don't follow single rules. You know, everybody isn't some sort of disciplined drone that was going along with things. And I think that message works. So, first of all, 2015, we need to do whatever we can to take as many seats for pro-independence parties. And remember that every time I say pro-independence, pro-independence and pro-social change are the same thing in Scotland now. They, they, there's, there's no differentiation between these. There is not a unionist party that wants to make any fundamental change to the UK economic and social system. And there is no independent supporting party that wants to keep it like it is. So there is a, a, a simple clear split here. And so if you're saying that, I don't, I don't care what we call it, tactically it wouldn't be clever to call it a yes alliance because there's, that's just you know, losing 5 or 10% of the vote that you can easily take. Um, I'm personally completely open-minded to people saying they should hold rule alliance. Um, I, I'm personally quite keen on anything which isn't talking about the constitution at all. So, um, a, a people's Scotland alliance, I don't care what it is, but let's create that. Let's show them that we can continue to work together, and above all, let's just work out how to take the Labour Party out. And I don't say that for spite. I say that because we have to look at an analysis of what's happening in Scotland now. What are the barriers to change? And the biggest barrier to change is the Labour Party. Because people who want change have, in the past, correctly voted for the Labour Party. The Labour Party was once the party of change. And, uh, and the, the fact that the change vote, a chunk of the change vote still goes into that party, and that party, what it's really become, what its real function now is, is to become part of the British establishment, part of the British state, that takes the change vote from people who need change and redirect it to make sure that change doesn't happen. Now, if we see, that's what the Labour Party has become. And it's not, I keep saying this, this is not necessarily meaning that every member of the Labour Party, every Labour politician doesn't want to change. It's just measure it. This is what happens. People who want change vote Labour and they don't get it. And this keeps happening. So not from spite and not from revenge, although a lot of revenge would pay me, um, but for reasons of simple structural and social change in this country, we need to recognise that Labour is not a party of change. I mean, in this whole referendum, this whole sorry, election, uh, leadership election, is one of them going to see a word which suggests that cutting benefits for people who have the lowest benefits in Europe, and in a country where poverty is endemic, cutting their benefits by another 1% to 2%, depending on how inflation is, is wrong? Is there a single thing to do with the standard This is not an out there view. If you take people who are in poverty 
people who are in incredibly precarious social positions and you cut their money, some of them will die. We will kill them. That is not a contested position. That is not something that people have to argue over. That is what happens when you take people who are at the very bottom of society and you hammer them. And that's what the Labour Party is proposing to do. Taking benefits away from the under 21 year under 25, I can't remember. These are awful policies. And so we have to fight that. But we also have to recognise that the Labour Party is also the biggest barrier, the biggest block to any serious um, constitutional change. Because far too many people in the Labour Party judge the constitutional power of Scotland according to their own personal constitutional power. And so the MP block, block keep blocking any chance of going further and more power for Scotland because it may undermine their personal position in Westminster. That's not good enough either. So we have to take them out. And it's not looking like it's going to be all that difficult if you're half competent. They are not popular, they are not organised, they do not have troops on the ground, they do not have numbers. Yes, they've got the mainstream media, but come an election campaign, I'm not quite sure how much that's going to work for them. I mean, are we, it's not like they held the record for ever not going to advocate um, that, that sort of support. So the polls are suggesting that that could be taken apart, so let's do it. Constituency by constituency. Let's be grown up. Let's show that this movement is what it can be, which is a clever grown up movement that will see all of us honestly in this seat. The candidate that can win isn't me, isn't my party, isn't my side. So we'll back the other. And it's not just about Greens and SNP, which I think is, I think there's signs of that's going reasonably well. But it's also identifying things like possibly, um, I'm going to say, down in the um, tip of Clydesdale, which gets absorbed into the David Mandela seat. So that's a Tory Liberal uh, marginal, but it's a Tory Liberal marginal which UKIP are targeting as their primary seat in um, Scotland. An independent candidate could go through that split vote and win. I don't think the SNP, I, my, my view is probably that seat can historically isn't winnable by our means or SNP, probably. So an independent could win, so that should be put up. Likewise, um, the own petition, Leslie Riddick, to stand in the north of Scotland against a Lib Dem up there. We can beat them all. Right, so we take Labour out, and we do what we can for more powers. I don't, I don't take the Smith Commission seriously. Nothing to do with Smith. He was just given a process which can't produce anything good. Um, and I've put this to other people. If you say to your children how much time have you set aside to do the housework, and they say 15 seconds, you just wouldn't assume that we're going to be doing any housework. Likewise, if you have a process which says we're really interested in your views and you've got 47 seconds to gain them in, you can probably conclude they're not really interested in your views. <laughs> so that's a structure which is not only non-deliberative, um, non-participative, non-democratic, it's anti-democratic, anti-participatory. It's actually structured in such a way that even if you wanted to engage with it, you couldn't. So I have no faith, I have no hope, and I won't mention it again. So, once we get in there, we push as much power as we can with a power block which really can drag Westminster to the left if Labour was the biggest of the Westminster parties and they would agree a, a, a um, conference and supply agreement. And in which case, let's get the conversation going. What would be your red line issues? Because we go in there now with such power. What would be your red line issues? For me, no trying for you. If, they, if the Labour Party wants our movement to prop it up, in Westminster to keep the Tories out, then there's no tribe, um, there's no benefit cuts. What are our red line issues? And then on top of that, what are the issues that as a movement we'd like to see them pushing? Some sort of serious move towards citizens' income, is that something we might suggest? So let's get this conversation going. Um, I don't care what you call your local groups, get together and start discussing exactly this. Start getting the ideas that you think are important, start passing them on to whoever it is that locally is your candidates. Put the pressure on. Let's not make this beat Labour. Let's make this beat Labour because there is something so much better out there for you. And that better looks like this. Let's decide what this looks like. So get those conversations going. Find out what you think and pass it on to whoever is your likes, to movement, parties, candidates and whatever. So we do that. We build a 2015 that can win and can win in a strong, positive manifesto. Next, 2016. Um, obviously, Politicians don't talk two elections ahead and focus on one thing at a time. I do. So 2016 is even more important for my money. One of the important, I think possibly the most important lesson for me of the campaign was that if you want people to see inspiring, hope-filled social change, you can't absorb a don't rock the boat strategy. I think we were 
it, it was a fundamental part of the campaign, which was because we need some middle class votes, we better not talk about anything too radical by way of change. But I mean, I always thought that was a mistake from the very beginning, simply on the basis that if you want people to take a big risk, and you know, whatever else it is, becoming an independent country right now, it's a risk, of course it's a risk. And it's big, you know, it's, it's everything. If you want people to take a big risk, you need to give them a big motivation. And if it'll be much the same, but we can manage it a little better, is not enough motivation in my view. So what is enough motivation? Well, how many times in doorsteps and meeting halls or whatever, did you hear the line, why haven't we used the powers that we've got to their full extent first? Well, let's answer that question by using the powers that we've got to their full extent now. Let's do that in 2016, and let's see, what can the Scottish Parliament do at the, at, the, at the boundaries of its powers? Way beyond what we've tried to do so far. What's an agenda for change? And there's two reasons why I think this is absolutely crucial. The first of those is that we need to show people that <laughs> a phrase has been used so much that another Scotland actually is possible, and we can start to build it. That there is a different model, a different way to build things, a different kind of society that we can create in Scotland if we are willing to use the powers to do it. Because my guy in Pennycook with his um, thoughts of suicide, he matters deeply to me. And if we don't use these powers to their full extent, we are abandoning people like that. And that in itself fundamentally isn't good enough. So let's get a proposal to deal with this. Maybe we'll say a couple of words about those maybe. And the second reason is that we have to show the limitations. We need to show people. Because this is one of the difficulties we had with this campaign was we, we started at zero miles an hour and we had to get to 100 miles an hour and we only had three years to do it. Now, for an idea as big as independence, which really wasn't part of public narrative, three years is not a long time to absorb this whole idea that we could be an independent country completely and have a different way forward. To get people engaged with that in three years is actually a remarkably short amount of time. So we need to start to get them to think about this every day as part of their life. What is it that we can do? What can we not do in Scotland? We can change the fundamental economic system, the second lowest wage economy in the developed world, the most punitive social security system in Europe, etc, etc. We can't do anything about that with the powers that we've got. So we've got to do everything we can to show this. So we try hard to mitigate the effects of the We try hard to transform the economy. economy. We use the powers that we have to make Scotland as different as we can. And every time we try to do this, we are going to find ourselves again and again by our elbows against the confines of the powers that we've got in Scotland. And we need to do that. We need to show people, not tell them, but show them that we cannot transform this country in the way that we want to and in the way that we should with the powers that we have. What does that mean? Well, I don't know yet. Commonweal is, our policy unit's just about to launch, and we've gonna have a big participative process. We're really interested in what people think. We love people to care about policy. And without going into it too much, um, we're gonna be launching a digital news service in a few weeks time. We're all absolutely scuttered sick with the news. So we've got an editor and four writers team of five are going to cover news every day in Scotland from a perspective that we don't get in the mainstream media. It'll be on a site called Common Space and you can go in there in the morning and run through a full news service. Um, and below that, we're not going to provide it because there's already great commentary sites like Bella Caledonia and, and many good blogs, but we'll pull together the best of the commentary sites. But below that, we're going to put a strand in. I, 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 I keep doing this because they, they appear in carousels. Um, <laughs> the main program, this is an iPad for those that hadn't worked it out. Um, <laughs> There, you, you, so you put get these kind of sales, you can go through the news, you can read the news, and then you can go through the commentary, you can read your commentary. What we're trying to do is integrate under that policy strand so that you start to get used to knowing what are the good ideas that are emerging in Scotland, what are the discussions that are happening, who's producing things. You know, Oxfam has done some fabulous work on the economy and participative democracy and so on, and it gets that in the head. Of course, um, Jim Murphy says he's going to do any populist piece of rubbish, and it's that in the head. And that's the wrong way around. We need a new service and a way of approaching these things and the ordinary people are these people who are interested and engaged and involved in policy and we want to involve you in that discussion. But we're going to press ahead with this because this is a massive job. By spring conferences, I hope we can start to be talking about the kind of agenda that Scotland should have. By late summer, I hope that we can have a big proposal, a whole series of integrated proposals for how we transform Scotland. And by party conference season next year, I hope that the Green Party and the SNP are looking at this and saying, yeah, this is Scotland's future. So we're starting that process now, certainly in the new year, we'll be um, putting a lot of material about how we do this. And what does that mean? Well, um, I'm only going to pick a couple of strands just to show
show you that we must not assume that because we lost, because we got a no, that that's it, ambition and big thinking have ended. No, they haven't. So one, austerity. We have to address this austerity. All we can do is pick up and mitigate the worst of the impacts of austerity because we don't have social security, we don't have core economic policies. So let's get our housing policy right for once. Let's have a massive programme of house building and I'm going to stop there and say no, not like every stupid comment that comes from a politician at Westminster or Labour's House and follow up here or something in the SNP. I don't mean the liberalisation of planning policy so the private developers can stick up lots more naughty boxes and sell them the price. What I mean is a proper housing policy. Let's build a massive new generation of first rate, high quality, well insulated, attractive housing at public sector rate prices. <laughs> Poor people who need it can get reasonable priced public sector housing. My idea of housing policy in this country is that anybody who wants to live in high quality public rental housing can do it. Young professionals in Germany do not have mortgages. Why would they hail if they have a mortgage? They're young, they are working, they're mobile, they live in high quality rental accommodation in much of its public sector. Let's get that in Scotland. Let's have, and this is my view. <laughs> who've lost houses because of bedroom tax or whatever, living in high quality housing right next to school teachers. Why do we have this social segregation in our housing? Because we've created segregated housing. Let's desegregate housing. Let's get people back together. Let's get Scotland back together, living back together in community again. We can do it. There's a range of policies. We can fund it. I, I won't go into all this just now, because we're going to do it. But we can fund this without having to borrow um, beyond a, an enclosed borrowing that will work from its rent as a long-term mortgage investment. We can create house factories. Those Germans have house factories that produce brilliant quality housing. We can take them out, we can assemble them, we can use land value tax and other policies to bring the values of land down so the public sector is not being able to buy. <laughs> Let's integrate absolutely wonderful first rate heating into it. Because that's the next thing we can do is make sure that people aren't cold anymore. And so we can create district heating and other systems of heating when we build this new housing. We could, for example, Using land reform, which is one of the big targets that we've got, land reform, we could take land in the north of Scotland back into protective use. We could plant it up with biomass. We could have large-scale biomass, pellets or chip or whatever. We could be using this to fuel district heating systems, which are keeping people warm in highly insulated houses at extremely low cost with our own natural resources. We can do this in Scotland if we give a damn on the track. So we can do all that sort of stuff to mitigate um, poverty. It won't be anything like enough. I, we need to do something with food. It's much harder. I'm really interested to see what creative ideas we can get on food. Um, do we have large scale, reasonable price of cooking clubs in which people take food back that they can microwave, in particularly in areas where people don't necessarily have you know, fully equipped kitchens? Do we go for something that makes a soup kitchen look much more like a restaurant that we can produce in the, uh, inexpensive food where people can eat communally and bring the price down for that? What can we do? We need to tackle the problem. Food, keeping your house in, are the three things that we might mitigate. We've got to do this. It's an act of sheer inhumanity not to put all of our efforts into working out how the people who are going to be hit worst by Westminster policies can be held in this country. Another theme. We think that we've probably lost everything on banking. You know, banking, we're done, there's nothing we can do because we didn't get the information. Not so. We can almost certainly create a national investment bank, just like we were proposing. I, I suspect the government can own it. But almost should have set up mutually, nationally, um, the government could capitalise it. We could probably take a tax of half a billion pounds a year from the whiskey industry. We could use that, put it into the bank. For each um, half billion pounds that you put in that bank, that bank can lend 10 billion. That's how banks work. They don't actually lend money to go, they lend money we don't have. And the 20 to 1 liquidity ratio would not be unreasonable for a national investment bank. So for every half billion pounds that we could put into that bank, it could lend 10 million pounds to social infrastructure problem, uh, projects, business, large scale industry development, whatever we wanted to do. So we can do that. We can get all these failing banks and really inject money into the national economy. And our local banking system, we can do that now. Every local authority in Scotland can set up a standard, normal, mutual bank. We can do it tomorrow. Those banks would take care of deposits. 
We would take, they would give you a loan if you need one, they'd give you a mortgage if you need one, they'd give you a credit card and a card to put in the bank machines. And the part of loan to small business, incredibly important. These banks, uh, it's these banks almost everywhere in the world, if you look at who is the lender to small business, it's local mutual banks that do most of it. And we can treat these banks alone. The they would do all these things. What they wouldn't do is regularly phone you up and ask if you have any customer service review. No, bloody wouldn't like customer service review. They're coming to talk to you about going to a customer service review. You know, I don't want another loan. I'm fine, thank you. Leave me alone. Stop fueling this debt problem in this country by using your marketing to screw over your customers. Let's create a <laughs> These are just a couple of the examples of the sorts of things that we could do in this country if we really wanted to. We can do more in energy. We can do more on economic transformation. We can do so much more in things like land. Um, it goes without saying that we have to act now. And if there's anybody from the SNP that's in on your party now, you have still got time to either augment that um, community empowerment bill or push a process for a new bill that will create proper local democracy in this country. We're the most centralised country in the developed world. It has to end now. We need a commitment to proper local democracy now. We have to start giving power back to communities and taking it away from the institutions. Because as long as we keep power where it is just now, it's the banks, the KPMGs, the uh, officer class and local authorities, the, um, the senior management and executive teams of the Labour local authority, these are the people who keep the power. Take it away, give it back to who should have the power, which is communities and the people that live in them. We need local democracy now. We, that's the second strand of what we're going to be lobbying on. Um, we've got a full-time parliamentary officer in Commonwealth who will lobby. If you need something lobbying on, you tell us, you get in touch, you see what issues are important to you. But the three issues that we agreed on was land for the, for the next number of months, land reform, local democracy, and participative and deliberative democracy. And these are the things that we're going to push on in the parliament. So we can create this manifesto and take it in 2020, uh, sorry, 2015, next October, to the party conferences and say, this is Scotland's agenda. We're going to try and build as much of this work as solidly done with the maximum amount of support that we possibly can, take this to the parties, and I hope that we can finally get a really radical approach to transforming Scotland within what we've got, which will also show what we don't have. So, we've created a, a Westminster block which has scared the parents off of the, the UK establishment. Um, I so look forward to the point when they say, but this isn't fair, why have we got to bend and twist our policy agenda to what this big block of bloody Scots want, to which we will just look back and say, bend it again, my friends, bend it again. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the answer we need to have a little to talk for before I start. Um, and so, I mean, now we've created the Scottish Parliament with a real capacity in it, it's really trying to do things for real, and I think we should try and create an electoral alliance to go into that as well. I won't go into the, the, the te technical details of that, just to say that if we can stand in the first vote on a combined um, platform and then split up Greens, Independents, whatever, on the list vote, we can maximise the number of seats that we take going into that parliament. Let's try and create a coalition parliament of us, a coalition of the social change people let's change Scottish society. And finally, I think, for five minutes, um, we can't ever do what we just did with this referendum, which is go in with reassurances um, and some broad big picture visions and tell people that it will be okay, that we will get this all worked out in these negotiations. We've got to learn the lesson of the Scottish Constitutional Convention. When they wanted to create evolution and it didn't work in 92, they got together and they said, we've got some time on our hands, let's get this right now. And they wrote a proposal that was widely supported, bulletproof, on the table for a long period of time, so that when the time came, 1997, to vote for um, the Blair government, we got, um, and then after that, the referendum in, 90, in late 1970, vote on the evolution, there was a plan on the table. People understood it, it was realistic, and it was properly tested. So let's learn a lesson. We, yes, Scotland just disappeared like that, um, which in some ways is breaking my heart, but on the other hand, it didn't leave this big hole at the middle of this movement. And the best suggestion I think so far for how to fill that is that the Scottish Independence Convention, which has been, you know, carrying the torch for many, many years when this subject wasn't on the public agenda, is going to reform itself. We're holding a conference in January. We're going to invite two people from all the national groups, I think one from all the local yes groups together, and say, can we just reconstitute ourselves as 
the place where the movement comes together and plans and discusses and debates. So that's another thing, it's, I can't remember the date, but sometime in January. And what I want to see is one of the big projects that can do is to replicate what the Constitutional Convention did, to prepare a proper prospectus, a real prospectus for independence. Now, whether it was right or wrong, and I, I always thought it was a mistake, um, I always thought it was not the best option to go for a currency union. I never really believed in the currency union. I'm not massively hostile to it, I didn't think it was the best option on the table. Whatever um, we think about that now, I think we can all agree we can't go into another campaign on a currency issue which relies on the other side giving us some form of charity. It won't work. We need to go into the next referendum campaign with a properly, fully costed model for currency. If we want to negotiate a Scottish uh, um, a currency union, okay, we still need a full, proper plan for currency and for everything else. Everything else. We need to have all the work done. Now, this prospectus, um, what people have suggested that this may be done is that the um, Independence Convention would take this project and parcel it out. So perhaps Business for Scotland could look at currency business regulation and National Collective could look at broadcasting issues and the um, Constitutional uh, you know, can look at the constitution, who we built that up, and Commonweal could take perhaps social security, fiscal, budget, finance, whatever, build all this up, spend a year, a year and a half working extremely hard to produce the very, very best proposals and prospects for a very independent Scotland. And we come together with this one, we bring it together, we build it up, and we look at it, and we test it, and we get international expertise and advice on it, and we build up a proposal which is so absolutely bulletproof, and so complete, and so proper, and so sensible, that people looking at it say, ah yes, at least nobody can now say, is this viable, is this working, we can show how this can work. Now if we do that, we put that together, and we get that out in 2017, and we put it on the table. Uh, and incidentally, if we get it right, we can go through all of the treaties, which they said, you know, all those treaties that we have to negotiate, most of it's routine. So let's just go through and say, this is what we'll do with all these treaties. Let's do the negotiations in advance, let's get it all done, let's put it on the table in 2017, and that, for me, is the day when we start a campaign. We start the second independence campaign, the day that, that uh, prospectus goes on a table. Once that's in the public domain, we can start it. We knock the doors, we hold the events, we get back on the high streets, we do everything. We don't have to call it an independence campaign. It'll be quite handy for other saying it's the fighting. We do that for three years solidly. And when we get to 2020, when we walk into the elections in 2020, we will have reached 70% support for independence. We will go into that election, and again, this is a long way to predict the future, but with another coalition, and that coalition has only one stance, only one position, early referendum of independence. We go into that with a proposal and a plan and a shared vision. We do it with a large amount of support in the public, and our strength, and our commitment, our networks, our drive has made this happen over the next four or five years. We go in, a general election, so a Scottish election in May, a referendum in September, and we're out like Christmas. Now, if we do this, if we follow this path, and we do take these steps, looking at everything we got wrong and fixing it, looking at all the things that we said we wanted to do, working out which of them we actually can do, so that anyone who doubted our resolve, doubted our courage, doubted our desire to change things, doesn't have that doubt anymore. If we do all of these things and we move forward, we can be in an incredibly strong position to do what we want to do in the not too distant future. One person said to me, you know, there are conversations between people, and one person said, I don't know if I can wait six years. And the other one says, how much did the last two years fly by? You'll not even notice it. Get working, get out there, get this built up, get this done. There is no doubt in my mind that they cannot win the next referendum. They, how, many, how many unions have you heard saying to you, oh, can I just accept your defeat? No, it's quite the same thing. No, I understand your position here. You know you can't win the next referendum, and you can't win the next referendum. Everybody knows you can't win the next referendum. That's why you're so desperate for there never to be another referendum. So let's make sure that we are prepped, that we are ready, we win that next referendum. And you know the best way to win that referendum? It's build a decent Scotland which is fit for the people to live in it now. And by the time we finish trying to build that Scotland, they will see why we failed to do some of the things that we wanted to, and it's going to be Westminster, and that is what's going to make Scotland no longer have any doubt it's time to get out. Let's make that happen and let's do it properly. There's no time to waste.